All right, welcome back to another episode of Bully Ball. Today I am joined by a special guest, um, three-time Super Bowl champ, three-time first-team NFL All-Pro, and three-time Pro Bowler, former 49er, guard setter, Randy Cross. How are you doing today, Randy? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Yep. So Randy's having some technical difficulties with this camera, so we won't be able to see his face, but we will hear him. Um, before we jump into the interview, Randy, is there anything that you're currently working on, you know, any charities, projects, anything like that? Um, no, just the same old fun stuff. Uh, I've got my yeah. podcast, uh, gotcha. which I do all the time and, uh, still with CBS doing that during college football season. Gotcha. Sounds good. Yep. I always see your, uh, Instagram and Twitter smoking up those meats. It's a hobby <laughs> of mine as well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yep, keeps you busy. All righty. So jumping into the first question here, um, when did you start to see the transition from like a mediocre team before to a dominant franchise, what the Niners were in the 80s and 90s? Um, well, I mean, in that early period that I was on the team, uh, we were we were okay my first year, and then there began the slide into, uh, um, well, much less than mediocre. Uh, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we won that, we won that first, even when we won the first Super Bowl in 81, I, I think it took the debacle of 82 to kind of refocus everybody, um, starting with that 83 season that, you know, maybe we took things for granted, uh, winning that first one and thought it was kind of not, not easy, but sort of took things, uh, took things for granted from the standpoint of, you know, how, how you did things and how they came about. And, uh, you know, goodness knows that 82 season was enough of a wake up call for a lot of us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so that kind of leads us into the next question. So like you mentioned in 78 and 79, you know, you guys took a little bit of a slide, you know, they were both like two and 14 seasons. What were those like for you? What was your mindset kind of going into those games, you know, after losing so many? It's hard to describe because usually as a professional, you don't get a chance to come back from that. Usually when you're on teams that are that bad, um, you know, you're, you're not doing, you're not playing football for a living much longer <laughs> when yep. you're that bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and that 78 team was arguably one of the worst teams ever. Mm -hmm. um, and probably as, as much as it sounds like an oxymoron, that 79 team at two and 14 might've been the best two and 14 team ever. <laughs> we scored a lot of points. We just couldn't stop anybody. Yeah. Um, and then it took, you know, it took until 80 and then the 81 draft that, you know, the defensive side kind of kept caught up. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so as Niner fans know in 1979, Joe Montana, that was his first year, as well as head coach uh, Bill Walsh. So when they came in, did you kind of see a mentality change in the team? You know, did Bill Walsh implement some things to kind of switch up the losing atmosphere? Um, I, I don't think how much I, I don't know how much he really implemented that that sort of thwarted the losing. Um, he got rid of all comfort. You know, you start playing, you survive enough bad years and bad situations. You kind of get comfortable. You figure you're almost bulletproof. Um, you know, he was my, in my first four years, I had five head coaches. So, you know, our first meetings early on, <clears throat> I know he made a point of pointing out to everybody that, uh, you know, at training camp that you guys were sitting there. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that, you know, you, you survived a few other coaches. You'll just survive this one, too. And, you know, then we'll wait till the next guy gets here. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he pointed out that we were playing for the worst franchise in the NFL. And he said, if you can't play for me, who can you play for? Yeah. So, yeah, I, he had a point. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think it was something – if, if you were in his offense and he had a place for you in his offense – um, you had a pretty good feeling that you might be around for a while, but I'll tell you what, it was brutal watching what was happening at some other positions, you know, like DB. 
I think one year at Santa Clara, which I think was 1980, um, 79 or 80, we, we went through like 27 defensive backs <laughs> in 20 in training camp that were cut. I mean, they, they were there for a lunch, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, some guys. So yeah, it was, it, it was very clear. He had a, he had a goal. Um, it was very clear. He was a really smart offensive mind. And we had a guy at quarterback in Joe that could do all the things he wanted. You know, we had Steve yep. DeBerg. Steve DeBerg could spin the heck out of the ball. He could throw the mm-hmm. ball like crazy. Um, but, you know, Bill wanted more. But Bill wanted movement. Bill wanted a lot of things. Um, and Joe also had that kind of it, as everyone found out later. But, you know, he, he had it at Notre Dame. He had it in high school. Um, and he sure as heck had it early on with the Niners. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Was uh, was learning Bill Walsh's offense a challenge for you? Because I know he was kind of the one that came up with the West Coast offense and what really implemented it into the NFL. So was that, a, was that difficult for you to learn that playbook? Um, no, not really. I, a lot of it was predicated on movement. So you had to have linemen that could move and run. Uh, one of the first things he did when he got there in 79, um, he made me a guard instead of a center. I had played center my first two and a half years and broken my ankle in Washington in 78. And um, I met with Bob McKittrick and him, and they said, you know, here's our offense. Here's some of our key plays we want to run. And it's predicated on having people at guard that can run and move and get out in front of people. Uh, and we think you can do that. So I was more than happy to do that. You know, part, <laughs> of it, part of it was something I knew I could do physically. And mm-hmm. the other part of it was just an innate kind of showmanship part of me that, that liked being out in front of people. Um, when you played center or you're in the middle of that scrum, people have to kind of take your word for it that you're out there. At least if you're, uh, you know, you're out leading the sweep or leading the screen or doing something like that, they actually see you on the field. But yeah, uh, yeah that, that whole thing about how he wanted to run his offense. And we did things different. We did things really different. Um, it was very much a power kind of macho game back then. And, you know, if, if we had to cut block you, we'd cut block you. If we were out running in the open field, we weren't going to punch in the mouth necessarily. We, we might knock you down. But, you know, the whole, the whole goal of everything we did as an offensive line was, to, was predicated on protecting and promoting the guys that carried the ball. And, yeah. you know, as long as you understood that, you did all right. If you put any of those guys in jeopardy, you weren't going to be around long. Yep, gotcha. Yeah, playing guard, it's definitely – you can definitely get some highlights as a guard compared to a center, you know, especially in an mm-hmm. offense that likes to move and run the ball towards the outsides and the edges. You can definitely get yeah. some good highlights. Yeah, um, but, I mean, but I mean, I became known after I retired more as a center than a guard. Yeah. Um, well, mainly because I made a Miller Lite commercial, a series of Miller Lite <laughs> commercials. Uh, that talks about being uh, me being an all pro center, which ironically, yeah. well, it wasn't true. But <laughs> it, you know, it, 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 in Hollywood, in the world of Hollyweird, it was true. Yeah, in the real world, it wasn't. But you know, yeah. it, it kind of got labeled as a center, and you know, all things being equal, uh, it was one of the great experiences of my, of my life. But I would have uh, maybe liked it if I'd have. Uh, Maybe made more of a point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I was I was an all pro guard, not an all pro center. Uh, when you made that transition to guard, did you have any prior experience at guard, or were you mainly just like a center in uh, college and high school and no, stuff? No, in college I played both. Uh, okay. My freshman year I played center. My sophomore year I played center and guard. My junior year I played both. I played a junior year I played guard. My senior year in college, we literally had two offensive lines. And on the first offensive line, I'd play guard. And on the second offensive line, <laughs> I'd play center. And yeah. we'd, we'd rotate every three series. So, or every two series. So it was, you know, it, it was fantastic for me. Because mm-hmm. it really showcased kind of what I could do. 
Yeah, definitely. Versatility as an O-lineman's key, especially even in the game nowadays, too. And I think uh, it was super interesting how you were saying that, like, Bill Walsh implemented a lot of movement in his offense because current 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan pretty much wants to do the same thing. He's going to emphasize athletic offense alignment rather than the big the big bruiser dudes that can just not move very well. So I think that's mm-hmm. pretty interesting how that transition yeah. even into well, he the does, he day. does He does the same stuff as dad too. Yep. You know, Mike in Denver was a big believer in the same thing. And a lot of his roots and a lot of his base beliefs go back to Bill too. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's something that kind of fluctuates, but never really goes out of style. And the main reason it doesn't go out of style is it works so damn well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, so going from six and ten in nineteen eighty and then thirteen and three and winning the Super Bowl, how was that for you? You know, were you guys realistically expecting to make a run like that going into that Super Bowl year? Well, I mean, realistically, um no. I mean, if if we'd have started set telling people in July of eighty one what we were gonna do, you know, six, seven months later you know, they might've had us committed because <laughs> we, we were okay. In, in 1980, we had a really good offense. Defense wasn't very good. Um, we really started playing good defense. We, we got the, that famous draft with Ronnie and Eric and Carlton, um, mm-hmm. the trades and acquisitions, you know, with Hacksaw and Gary, big hands, Johnson and, uh, Fred Dean, go down the list of those guys. Um, our defense got dominant after yeah. that happened. So once you have that kind of in your hip pocket, you know, sort of the sky's the limit when, when you know you're going to move the ball and you know you're going to score because the pressure is all on the other guy from warm-ups on because they know the team across the field is going to score. So – you know, it becomes almost like a tennis match. And if you don't hold serve, you suddenly have to, you know, you're, you're rallying back and trying to trying to get break points and you're trying to do all these extracurricular things that for most teams is kind of out of character. Mm-hmm. Definitely. When did, when did you start to realize in, in the 81 season, you know, that like, okay, we're, we are legit, you know, we can actually make a real run in these playoffs. When, when was that for you? I think it started uh, in the first half of the year when we beat uh, – we went to Washington and beat them. We went to Pittsburgh and beat them. Dallas came to us, and we spanked their ass mm-hmm. um, at Candlestick. And that was kind of a payback for the first last couple of, year, the f- couple of years before that, that they had just embarrassed us down in, D- in Dallas. Um, none of us had any – you know, thoughts that this was a preview of the NFC championship game. Um, It was just, I don't know, it was something that needed to be corrected. (laughs) We're (laughs) glad we were able to uh, correct it. Yeah, definitely. So that kind of leads me into my next question. When you say NFC championship game, you know, what is the first word that pops in your head when you hear red, right, tight, sprint, right option, which was obviously the, the catch. What is the uh, first word that pops in your head when you hear that play? Uh, Dwight. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was, it's funny because in the first game we played Dallas that year, we scored on that play. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was our first drive. And I it, we ran it earlier in the game, and it was very effective. And it was always a great play. And it was, it was built to go to Freddie Solomon. Yep. You know, Dwight wasn't supposed to be the the ultimate receiver. He was the backup to the backup um, sort of option. But, you know, of course, if if everything was to go to plan, the ball's supposed to be thrown behind the tight end. Mm. And if you, you know, if anybody that's ever seen that, that highlight, Joe's a little bit further right than behind the tight end. By the time he lets go, (laughs) he's almost out of bounds. But, uh, yeah, that play was, that, that play changed a lot of lives. Yeah, definitely. Because I know uh, Tom Brady was in the stands for that game as well. So that's kind of mm-hmm. interesting to see how those two correlated. Uh, so strapping on the chin strap and everything with you for this play, going through it, you know, once Joe started getting the pressure on him, started spinning out to the sidelines, 
what were you kind of thinking? Were you thinking like, oh shoot, this play's done, or you, what was your uh, what were you thinking for that one? Well, at, at first, you know, both Keith Feinhorst and I, you got it pounded into your brain two things with Joe Montana as your quarterback. Um, one, he was very very precise, and two he was active as heck and you were never really sure where he was going to be. So when your defenders start sprinting to the sideline and you're going to the sideline and you, you're going, wait, wait a minute. He's not supposed to be on the sideline. He's supposed to be behind the tight end. Um, you know, you knew there was some ad lib happening and, yeah. you know, and that's, that again was something that, it, that, that would sort of become part of the legend that was Joe's game. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously the 49ers go on to an NFC, NFC championship off the catch. Uh, going into Super Bowl sixteen, how was that game for you? How was the week leading up to it? Just the overall atmosphere of the team and just actually getting to the Super Bowl, you know, the the biggest stage in football. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always been a, I've had always been a big football fan. I mean, I went to the Super Bowl – um after the 76 season with the Raiders and the Vikings down at the Rose Bowl mm-hmm. um I got married in January of 79 and my wife and I on our way to the Bahamas for our honeymoon stopped in Miami for the that great Super Bowl between the Cowboys and the uh, Steelers down in Miami in the Orange Bowl yeah. um you know so the Super Bowl to me was was very very special it was you know, I, I had no delusions as to what that could do to be able to play, especially to win in a game like that. But, you know, it was in Detroit. It was butt-ass cold. <laughs> there were ice storms. And when there were ice storms, there were snowstorms. And it was, uh, it was definitely a – it was the first non-warm city Super Bowl. And, I, and everybody that was involved in that week, I think, Most of us were sure the game had come off well. It almost had to be delayed because of all the people late getting into the stadium um, because there was so much snow and there was so much security. Vice President Bush had held everybody up getting in. Um, But, you know, God, it was it it was not the Super Bowl that I had expected. Mm hmm. To be to be honest with you, and and all three of my Super Bowls were all were were kind of unusual situations. You know, the first cold one, um, really, the the first home one. You know, the Rams had played in the yeah. Rose Bowl against the Vikings. I mean, against the Steelers, but you know, Stanford Stadium was what is Stanford Stadium like? Four miles from the old facility, three miles mm-hmm. from the old facility in Redwood City. So, I mean, that was in our backyard. That was a home game. And that was not much fun, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> every, every, every friend, relative, and distant relative you could think of was uh, calling for tickets. <laughs> um, and then my last game in 88, that was in Miami. And that, that Super Bowl had a whole different set of circumstances around it. Yeah, definitely. Did uh was playing in the cold, you know, being that cold, did that change your guys' game plan for the offense or is it still stick to the same stuff? Oh, it, it would it always stuck to the same stuff. And in, in this case, you know, we we're playing indoors, so it wasn't gonna be a, a really a cold game. It would the the cold was gonna be the influence during the week and when you've tried to go out at night and getting there during the day and mm-hmm. those type of things. It was it was a it was more of a inconvenience than a hindrance. But yeah. I never had really associated inconvenience with Super Bowls. I always thought Super Bowls were, you know, something that was almost a luxury item. Yeah. Not a survival test. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I know you kind of mentioned it uh, earlier in the podcast, but the strike shortened season the following year, you know, the team kind of fell off a little bit. What do you think happened in that season? You know, like you said, did you guys think – you know, it's going to be easy to get back to the Super Bowl, or was it something else? No, I, I, I just think we uh, we enjoyed our success too hard and too long, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of forgot how we would got how we had gotten there the year before. As a group, um, we had guys that were on that '81 team that never made it to the '82 team for various reasons. 
Yeah. Um, you know, much of which happened off the field. Mm. So, you know, it was uh, in our first experience too with when you win a Super Bowl, you are automatically everybody's rivalry game. You're automatically everybody's homecoming game. You're automatically, I mean, you're, you're in, in big highlighter on their schedule, everybody's yeah. schedule. And uh, we didn't cope with that well. We, we would later learn to cope with it a lot better because, you know, like you talked about the standard that between Bill and Eddie and that organization, you know, they, they were going to treat you the best, but they expected the best in the way of results. So, Definitely. you know, there was never any mixed feelings as to if you were, you know, if you were paid really well or if you got, you know, something. Um, there was a, there was an expected return and the expected return was winning and winning just regular winning after once you win a Super Bowl, regular winning is just sort of a step. Yeah. There's only one, one really successful way to end the season. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, fast forwarding a couple years going to 1984, you know, at 15 and one Super Bowl champs arguably the most successful team in 49ers history. What were a couple of reasons for that, do you think? Um, well, I, I would say great staff, uh, laser-focused football team, unbelievable defense. You know, the whole hype about that Super Bowl was about Montana and Marino. Yep. And for some reason – all the genius football people sort of had missed the slight issue of that defense we had, specifically that, that front seven we had mm -hmm. that were just, they were really, really good. Marino yeah. came to, didn't take Marino long to figure that out, <laughs> but yeah, they were, they were really, really good. That's, that's the reason I think that's like, a, that's the best team I ever played on was because yeah. of guys like Ronnie and Fred and Hacksaw and just go down that whole list. It's a pretty impressive list of football players. I mean, our defensive line was eight or nine guys rotating, many of which who'd been all pro and, and were extremely good at what they did. It was, it was fun to watch. We had a defense that was worth watching on the sideline. Because we'd get a little drink and talk to our, you know, McKittrick or one of our other coaches. And then we'd go over and we'd watch our defense torture the other guys. <laughs> Usually it didn't take them long. Usually they were off the field pretty quick. But, you know, oh, but man, they were so talented. That was, that was sort of the underappreciated part of the team. Because everyone talked about the West Coast offense and Bill Walsh and Joe Montana and all that. But no one who played the Niners wanted any part of that defense. Yeah, definitely. I think I know the answer to this question, but obviously playing against uh, a defense like that, especially the front seven for an offensive line, do you think that helped you guys out a lot and kind of like raised that standard that you guys played at as well? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We, yeah. uh, we, we, you, there's a lot of pressure when you've got guys like Fred Dean and Ronnie Lott and, Hacksaw and Big Hands and Tui Asasopo and, you know, all those people, Keena Turner. I mean, I'm not leaving people out, but, um, you know, your job. I mean, if you punt, you almost have to, you almost t apologize to the other side <laughs> as you're going off the field. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, you expect a lot out of each other. And the good thing was, you know, we could both, both sides could deliver. Mm -hmm. Um, so in practices, going against a defense like that, who was your toughest matchup personally? Um, it would vary. You know, I thought Louis, Louis uh, Kelcher, Gary Johnson, Lawrence Pillars, Dwayne Board, you know, all those guys that played inside. Michael Carter, who got there the next year in 80, 85. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, and all pretty much – if not all pro, probably all should have been. So it was, uh, it was an interesting challenge. And people have to remember, once we got out of training camp, Bill didn't have us, we didn't hit much at all. 
we would carry our pads out and do nine on seven and one on one pass rush. But otherwise, we didn't wear shoulder pads. Mm. We we learned how to practice full speed without hitting, which no, sounds nice. kind of excited to use a Kevin Hart term from one of his current movies. You know, it's non contact boxing. But, <laughs> you know, really what it was, it was non contact football. Yeah. And if you could do it full speed, and then you could take that full speed from practice and do it in a game. Um, that was the key. That was the important part that you could do it without missing a beat. Gotcha. Do you think that, uh, that definitely like prolonged a lot of players careers doing practice that way, you know, where you're not having contact. Cause I know even currently now, a lot of players get hurt in training camp because of the contact and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So do you think, uh, the way that you guys practice, uh, NFL teams should implement that now? Uh, I think many do already now. Um, the, the players association has got it to the point where limited numbers of padded practices. Yeah. Um, at that level, you don't need to beat the crap out of each other. And if you need to beat the crap out of each other, it doesn't say much about, you know, how consistently you're taught the right things. Cause you know, bang me on the head a few times. I'm going to avoid getting banged on the head. Mm -hmm. Um, and we found out that, you know, those shots to the brain are not a good thing anyway. Uh, I think the number one thing that it was that was advantageous about that style of practice was we were fresher at the end of the year than anybody else. It wasn't yeah. even close. We get in November, December games. Um, you know, their legs were tired, their bodies were tired, and honestly, just we just weren't. Yep, definitely. Um, so going back to the '84 season. Was there any major differences besides like the weather and stuff we talked about before um, between Super Bowl 19 and then Super Bowl 16? Was there any major differences for you? Uh, besides the home game? Um, yeah, I mean, it was Stanford was a great, a great stadium, great old venue. The new place, the new stadium and whatnot is really nice. Um, and when you have an unlimited budget like Stanford does, you should be able to build a nice stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I mean, it, it, it was starting, the Super Bowl was starting to become the Super Bowl around Super Bowl 19. And when I say the Super Bowl, I mean, just the hype fest that the Super Bowl is, the daily press conferences, the, you know, just constant scrutiny for that entire two week period. And, you know, the whole two week period thing is for a while was being contested that there shouldn't be a week off and that it was, it was affecting the quality of the game and all that. Um, but it was, the Stanford experience was, was pretty cool. Uh, the home side of it away. Um, it was, it was, it was like one of my ideal Super Bowls from, you know, playing in the Rose Bowl or playing in the Orange Bowl or it was with the Super Bowl. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. It was the way the Super Bowl was supposed to be. You know, yeah. it was big. It was a. It was a, just a more of a spectacle than anything else. And like I said, the Super Bowl was starting to become the Super Bowl. Yep, definitely. Yep, because now, like you said, it's a media thing. You know, they have the media day for the Super Bowl. All these interviews, just a bunch of spotlight on it now, and it's just going to continue to get bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, mo and guys go out of their way to kind of – some guys go out of their way to kind of make make it about them. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's human nature. You get around that much – that many cameras and that many microphones, you want to make sure people know who you are and you want to be able – you want to be heard and you want to get a chance to say what you want to say. Um, yep. And sometimes guys that do that too much can have a tendency to – overload their lizard ass with their alligator mouth <laughs> yep definitely um and when i when jerry rice came in in 1985 did you guys know that he was going to be a franchise altering player you know right when he stepped in the door did he have that instant impact oh yeah oh yeah no it's it was pretty crazy from the jump i mean one of the first practices we had in rockland um, and we all knew that, you know, Jerry got drafted and the whole fact that he had run like a four, six, five or a four, seven, 40 and the combine stuff. And, um, but he was in that offense 
you know, with Willie Toten down there at Mississippi Valley, it was unbelievable the numbers they put up. So we knew he was something pretty special. But first practice, Bill has Joe throw a bomb. And he's being guarded by Eric Wright, who was our fastest cornerback. Eric, you know, E. Wright was down in the, the 4 3, 4 4 area, 40 yard dash wide. And Jerry ran by Eric Wright. And, you know, you looked, saw the look on everybody's face. You looked at Bill and the <laughs> smile on his face. You went, yeah, that guy's not bad. That guy's not bad. <laughs> and he, people forget his first, three, his first year in 85, he had a few draw, he, a few drop balls. Mm-hmm. And he had a couple issues. Um, but as everyone that's ever been around Jerry Rice knows, um, he had a work ethic that was unbelievable. And the you know he didn't thrive on the touchdowns and the eighty yard plays. I think the the drop balls and the missed routes and all the, those served to motivate him more than anything else because it got to the point where he was almost torturing defenses. Yeah, definitely. I mean, of course, everybody all knows of the hill that he would run in the off season and everything that came yeah. with that. So. Roger Roger Craig showed him that hill, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. Roger, Roger was the one that originally was doing those those workouts, and he and JR got, got to doing those. And, gotcha. you know, the schedule of doing the stuff that he did, you run in those hills in the morning, and then he'd, <clears throat> he'd run or he'd lift in the early afternoon, and then he'd go run down at Stanford and do sprints in the afternoons. So those guys would do that all the time. Yeah. And, and did you, you ever – uh... Oh, hell no! I just never <laughs> Rick got on that hill. I never saw yeah. a hill on a football field, so I didn't yeah. feel any need to be running up one. <laughs> True, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense because Roger Craig, you know, they called him the high stepper, so you definitely got a high step on that hill. That's for sure. Um, what what are some of your keys for a successful, long career in the NFL? What would you tell like a young guy coming in now that plays offensive line, let's say, what would be some of the keys you would give them to have a successful career? Um, you know, I, I think some of the stuff that happens in the off season is probably the most important time of the year. Um, you know, that's, that's where people get better, whether mm-hmm. you're getting stronger or you're getting quicker or, you're refining techniques. Um, you know, you, you can't always out ability people. In fact, it's often impossible. But almost anybody you can outwork. And, you know, I, as a group, I think that's something that, you know, our team did. You know, like, like we talked about all the all the hitting and everything else. Well, you know, there's a there's a term that's become famous of you know, work smarter, not harder. Yep. And that's that's kind of how we played. We played smarter, not harder. You know, if, if, if you have to hit, you have to try to run over something and hit it 12 times uh, before you knock it down, you know, I don't know. Why not run around it? Shit. Don't mm-hmm. run over it. There's, <laughs> if it ain't going to move, run around it. And that's <laughs> That's kind of what we did. And I think that's something – you know, as a team, as an organization, you know, you, you, you tended to get in, sort of infil, infiltrated in your brain the whole idea of, you know, your work ethic and everything you did related to how you played. Yep. Everything. Definitely. If you were lifting, it was there. If it was running, uh, it, you know, if you're gonna, just going to run, why just run? Why run sprints? You know, if you're an offensive guard, run routes, run pull routes, run trap routes, run sweep routes, run screen routes, run stuff like that. That's, you know, sort of became the way that, especially for me, that's that's what I would tell people because you can work smarter than than a lot than other guys. You can you can mm-hmm. refine your techniques. You can do things like that, and I think. That's one of the one of the, if not the most important thing, is how much you improve in the offseason. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Super Bowl twenty three obviously is one of the closest in 
from a fan's perspective, the best for the best Super Bowl that the Niners ever played it played in. What was that game like for you? And was it any different than the other two? You know, was this one? Did you notice? more media spotlight on this game or anything like that? How is it different for you? Well, there were a couple of things that made that game different besides, you know, my last game. Uh, the, the field conditions, which is something you don't hear about a whole, whole lot, but the, the crew that takes care of the football field for the, for the Super Bowl had left the pumps on at Joe Robbie. And it had sucked all the uh, moisture out of the field. That's why it was coming up in chunks. And they had to repaint it the day of the game. Um, really not, not ideal conditions of that football field. That's one of the reasons that it made what, you know, John and, and Jerry and Roger and the things that they did all the more impressive because of the conditions of that field. Um, you know, I think that was something that, that was to be overcome but it was – the game itself was pretty sloppy. It's kind of like that famous catch game. A lot of penalties, mm-hmm. turnovers, things like that. Um, you know, that season had been a, a great kind of comeback for us. We had started six and five, then went on a winning streak, won the division, and, you know, got through the playoffs. That was our, wor- that was our worst game, worst performance probably as a team. Um, that we had had since maybe we were six and five uh, and we chose to do it in the Super Bowl, which wasn't good. <laughs> we just got in a situation where at the last second they were able to snatch it uh, in the way of a, you know, a, a late win like that. But, yeah. you know, that's, that's that whole in spite of somehow, some way, you know, attitude. Mm-hmm. If, you, if, you're, if your goal is to beat the crap out of people every single week, every single game, you're going to be sorely disappointed yep. if your whole focus is on winning, but winning by whatever means necessary, whatever you have to do, you're going to win. You know, I think you can always make a, make a case or find a way to do that. Yeah, definitely. Going into that season, did you know that you were going to retire? No, 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 not at all. So why 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 did you decide to retire, especially after winning the Super Bowl? Um, just time. You know, it's it, it was the ideal, I in my mind, situation mm-hmm. to and, and to 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 do go out and to do it that way. Um, I had always been a big, uh, you know, I, I was a rather voracious reader from a young age. And one of the things I started reading a lot about were old sports stories, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, didn't matter. I just was, you know, Olympic, Olympic athletes, that type of thing. I was really interested in what made people like that tick. And the one common thread, the more people you studied, um, was the kind of declining way most people went out. Yeah. You know, and uh, I was lucky. I was really lucky to go out the way I did. Definitely, definitely. Uh, obviously, looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. But do you regret retiring in '88? Since you know, the following year, the Niners went back to the Super Bowl and won it to go back to back. Did you? Uh, do you regret retiring in '88? You know, possibly yeah, I, I, having four Super Bowls. '89. I went to work with CBS and had a great time. I was supposed to do like seven games. I ended up doing 15. Uh, I was working with the NFL today uh, with the NFL playoffs. So I was on the field at Candlestick for the divisional game. And that was the first chance I'd really gotten to be up close with the Niners. And I remember standing there on the sideline watching them warm up and seeing the beginning of that game and going, shit, they're going to do this again. (laughs) Um, But... Yeah, no, I I was at peace with kind of the decision I made, mm-hmm. but I was also lucky enough that Super Bowl down in New Orleans, uh, Hank Stram got laryngitis, so I ended up filling in for him for part of that game with Jack Buck on CBS Radio, and gotcha. made that it made that even and a little bit more special being able to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
who, in your opinion, was the most influential player on you throughout your career? Um, I don't know. Player? Player. I mean, I let's player, coach, whoever. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had – I had my offensive line coach, Bob McKittrick. I mean, Mm -hmm. I've had a series of UCLA connected um, offensive linemen or uh, linemen in general um, that were throughout my football career. I mean, Steve Butler was on the 66 UCLA Rose Bowl team. He and Mo Friedman, uh, who was his line coach at Crespi, they were my coaches in high school and very much, you know, Crowther sled techniques, all that. Um, then I went to UCLA and Terry Donahue recruited me there. Another UCLA ex defensive lineman uh, who was huge in technique and, and doing things the right way. Uh, and then Bob McKittrick for 10 years. Uh, I was lucky enough to have for a short period in my career, Howard Mudd, who liked Bob McKittrick, you know, was a real attention to detail guy. So, You know, I think like most players that are lucky enough to play for a long time, you know, you might think it's you, but, you know, if you look at it closely, a lot of it is, you know, those in the game around you that enable you to be, you know, what you are as a player. And I was, I had no delusions. I had a whole series of coaches and people around me that enabled enabled me to be, do what I did. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously the last, I believe the last year you played, Steve Young was on the team as well, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, uh, he had gotten there in 87, so the last two years. Gotcha. Did, uh, did him being there with Joe, did that create any tension? Because that's something that a lot of Niner fans think is <laughs> going on now with yeah. Trey Lance and Jimmy G. No, com- no, no comparison. No, not at all. Not even close. A. Gotcha. The first guy hasn't won shit. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mean to be too harsh on Jimmy G, but <laughs> yeah, he's been to a Super Bowl, but he hasn't won anything. Yep. Um, and the guy behind him has done significantly less. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's played in less than twenty football games since high school. Yeah. So you know, I. Uh, I, 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 they want to make it that way. And I think the reason it kind of gets made that way is those situations can be very divisive in the locker room mm-hmm. because people take sides and, you know, I, I, it's, it's just natural. That's kind of the way it, it happens. Um, it takes a special kind of coach and a special organization to not only um, nurture, but foster that situation. Bill was able to do that. Um, because he built an atmosphere with the Niners after that 82 season that, you know, there was nobody irreplaceable. So once you understand that, you know, if if you were a Niner in, you know, 1989 or 1988 or 1987, and they're messing with Joe and they bring in Steve, how secure is your job? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You know, that was that was the main message. I don't know how many people really took it that way, but anybody with a brain <laughs> took it that way. Yeah. Because they were going to find a way to replace you. If, you, if they were going to yeah. mess with him, they were going to replace you. And yeah. that kept that kept people on edge. And people on edge usually perform the best. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Did uh did you notice any difference as from your perspective as an offensive lineman? in a blocking difference from Joe to Steve, you know, because obviously people know Steve was very mobile. One of like one of the best uh, running quarterbacks in the history of the NFL. Did yeah. you notice any difference there was blocking wise for that? Yeah. Well, you never really, you never knew where Joe was going to be. Uh, the difference is you never knew where Steve was going to be either, but wherever he was going, he was going there a lot faster than you could. Um <laughs> Yeah, he was he was very, very fleet of foot. Um, and when he learned to, you know, I think when he first got there, he knew how to throw like crazy and he knew how to run like crazy. But when he learned how to run to pass instead of run to throw, 
uh, or run to run, um, that's when he became really, really dangerous. And, you know, once that period, and it took a while, people forget, you know, I hear this stuff in the comparisons all the time with this whole Jimmy G and, and trade deal. And I, and I want to look at him and go, you know, that stuff lasted like four or five years. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't yeah. like a, hey, I was there for a year or so. Nah, <laughs> it was, it had a, it had a life of its own for a good long time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, it's something I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Niner fans look back fondly on having that kind of a back-to-back -back presence at the quarterback position, but it did kind of come with a price. Yep. Definitely. Um, going into those Cowboys games, you know, that's what really started this rivalry between the Niners and Cowboys. Obviously, nowadays it's not the same as what it was back in your day when you played. But was there a different mentality going into those games than if it was just another game against, say, the Vikings or, you know, another just NFC team in general? Yeah, I mean, every every winning organization and winning team, it's it's a great dynamic. Like when we played the Bears or we played the Giants or we played the Redskins, um, you know, Dallas had that mystique and that whole that self self created America's team <laughs> label. Um, you know, uh, that and as a football team, they're kind of like they're kind of like the weather in Atlanta. You know, it tends to peak in the nineties. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, there was something different about playing the Cowboys because they had fans, it, they had playing fans everywhere. Now, in the ensuing years after, you know, we'd won a couple of Super Bowls, you could probably say the same thing about the Niners. But, you know, for the longest period of time, there was not another fan base besides the Cowboys and maybe the Steelers that would claim a, you know, truly national, if not international fan base. And part of that was marketing and part of that was winning. Yep, definitely. Definitely. Um, this is a little bit off for the 49ers, but playing, you played at UCLA, obviously a very well-known college football team. What do you think about their move to the big 10? I, 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 it, it was kind of a, a jolt, you know, when you first heard of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, if you look at it, by the time the football season hits, you know, right now it's being referred to as kind of a tsunami. Yeah. Uh, you know, this huge thing that happened. Well, you know what? Wait until September. And that news will, that news will be a lot more relative. You'll see a lot different. You have a different perspective on that happening because there's going to be a lot more of it happening. There'll be more teams added and, and subtracted and, you know, a lot of it's window dressing for what needs to ultimately happen for this whole thing to be right in college football. And that's, we need a solid leadership group, you know, whether that's the playoff committee, whoever, but we need a lot, a solid leadership group, we need definitive rules because as we're finding out right now with this whole NIL and whatnot, anarchy is not always a good thing. And, you know, it's organizations and teams and sport, they need structure. And right now college football has got a lot of stuff, but you know, the most, the most significant structures in college football, they're stadiums. And that's not a positive sign. Yeah, definitely. That kind of leads me into my next question. How do you feel about the NIL? Oh, I mean, I, you can't begrudge. It was only a matter of time. Yeah. Because um, what was currently being sort of foisted on college football players was a farce. It was larceny. I mean, they were literally stealing billions of dollars. And I, I love how people always get indignant. Well, they're getting a free education. Yeah, well, watch how, how long this whole student-athlete term remains common you're not going to hear about student athletes in another 18 months or so they're all going to be athletes they're all going to be players um they're going to be paying taxes to the irs won't be long now in the next 18 to 24 months uh they're going to be they're going to be unionized they're going to be collected in bargaining 
there's going to be a lot of things going on that are not associated with college football. So if, if you're a purist and you prefer your football to be, you know, I don't know, amateur, whatever that term means these days, um, you're shit out of luck. Yep, definitely. College football is definitely in for a huge change. Probably going to see a lot <laughs> of it coming. Definitely. Uh, so my last question to take us out, do you have any interesting – stories funny crazy any interesting stories from your time with the Niners you know it could be about any player um not a whole lot I mean not always shareables oh, yeah, uh, you know there's some there's some you know the legendary stuff the John Candy story and the go down that list uh mm-hmm. of things that happened um and yeah, I, I say all the time you know there's some some stuff associated with the 49er franchise that, you know what? If they should be true, (laughs) (laughs) I think they're true. And if they're not, eh, the hell with it. It makes for a good story. Um, (laughs) No, it was, uh, and that goes back to the whole winning thing. You know, you don't, there are very few organizations that get famous or are remembered for being lovable losers. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Mm-hmm. Um, the old Brooklyn Dodgers were, they referred to them as lovable losers. You know, what? It, talk about the ultimate backhanded compliment. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lovable loser. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just something that uh, doesn't quite sit right. But uh, mm-hmm. no, I mean, I stories, stories are stories. I think we all we all have our own memories. So when you all have your own memories, your, your stories tend to all di- change and be a little bit different. Yeah, definitely. All right. One more question, actually. What is your greatest football accomplishment? Is it winning the Super Bowls or is it any personal accomplishments that you can think of? Anything like that? Well, I played in a team sport. So, you know, anytime you can do some of the things that we did as a team, you know, whether it's, you know, winning the divisions, you know, Bill Walsh's favorite thing was he had these, you know, it it always always used to be a big deal to win the division, you know, NFC West. Mm -hmm. Um, So Bill went out and he made these little belt buckles and we won the first time we won the division, he handed out these belt buckles and we're looking at these things going, what the hell is this? And he kind of stood there and he went, yeah, these kind of crap, aren't they? Not really a big deal. (laughs) He goes, well, neither is winning your division. You don't win the NFC and you don't go to the Super Bowl. You don't win the Super Bowl. It really doesn't matter. Uh Um, And in a team sport, you know, I I was lucky enough to to do it three times and was played with a great group of guys. Um, So that in that context, in the football context, you know, the individual recognition was something that was, it was nice to be pro bowl. It was nice to be you know, all pro and all that stuff, but so many, so much of that is kind of an uninformed popularity contest. It was mm-hmm. then, and it still is now. Yep. And, you know, that's, that's something I have always been very, very strongly, of, strongly of the opinion that, yep. you know, I, I didn't put much weight. I especially didn't put much weight in the pro bowls. Mm-hmm. because having been an ultimate alternate rep and read the pro bowl ballots that come out of guys, it's like, these guys don't know who plays where, yeah. <laughs> yep. you know? So, um, no, it's, 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 it's you, you have to, if you play a team sport, you have to take your, you know, sort of make hay with the, the stuff that you do as a group. And that was one of the great things about being the kind of team we were, we, got a chance to accomplish a lot of fantastic things with the group. Yeah, definitely. One last thing. So going off of that, what do you think about not being in the hall of fame? Do you think you deserve to be in the hall of fame or do you say you don't weigh too much on that? Yeah. I think the main thing I'll I'll say about that is the same thing I've said for a while. Um, I don't burn many calories or worry too much about things. I have absolutely zero control over. Yeah. I don't worry about the weather. Uh, I don't worry about other things like that, that, you know, I, 
what time the sun comes. I mean, I'll, there's all mm-hmm. kinds of things you can think of. Uh, yeah. I've got the ultimate respect for the guys that are in it. Um, some of the great teammates I played with are in it. And I think it's fantastic. A guy like Roger Craig, it's a, it's ridiculous that he's not in it. Um, I was so happy when Eddie got in, you know, cause we all know what kind of a click that can be. Mm-hmm. And he was never one of the good old boys. He was yeah. always a fellow shit disturber. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of, part of how that goes. It's, you know, there's, there's people that go along and there's people that, you know, strive for popularity contests. I was never one of those guys and I never really burned many calories worrying about it. Yeah, definitely. Like, like you said too, you know, the guys that are voting these people in are the media people that don't even know much about football in general. They just kind of cover the teams, but they don't know the real impact of like somebody like yourself has had on a team, you know? So. Yeah. I well, yeah, and, and it's, there's different styles of football. That's what makes football so special. Yep. You know, basketball tends to be a, you know, you look at them and go, well, they've got this guy, this guy, this guy, they can beat anybody. You know, Steph can shoot from the locker room and, you know, those type of people. Um, you know, in football, you can, you can be powerful. That's, that's like the teams I played on. We were in the top five to 10 teams in the league most of the time in Russia that mm-hmm. I was in the league. You never really were associated with that. You know, we were a finesse team. We weren't a power team, at least if you believed everything you read coming out of the East Coast. And that's, you know, part of it's the and it, it, people that don't think that's real are delusional that the East, East Coast, East West bias in all sports, you know, it's, it's pretty real. Um, so I don't know. The Pac-12 is finding out about that pretty aggressively in college football. That you know they've slowly been surely, but kind of been left behind. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, before we get out of here, do you want to tell the people what your uh, podcast channel name is one more time? Yeah, it's uh, Randy Cross Podcast. You find that at randycross.com. Uh, it's a. Uh, I, I have a lot of fun doing it. I. I it, it's honestly, it's main, mainly sports, mainly football, but. A lot of different things, a lot of different guests. Um, sort of depends on who I feel like talking to and what I feel like talking about. And a little bit of food and a little bit of fun and a, lot of, a little bit of feel-good stories. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's fun. There's not many podcasts out there like it. I mean, I've yeah. been doing it now for several years. And it's not just audio. It's actually video and everything else. So mm-hmm. I th- I'm biased, but I think it's worth taking a look at. Yep. Yep. If you're watching this video, go definitely go subscribe to that and go follow uh, Randy Cross also on Instagram if you're a big fan of food because you'll see a bunch of good looking barbecue, you know, <laughs> see a bunch of it. So definitely go go take a look at those. Um, thanks for coming on, Randy. This is definitely fun. A lot of fun. A lot of information to find out. Uh, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Be Thank well, you. Have Alex. a good one. You too. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Turn it back. Money. Money.